pile of other responsibilities. So there's a really an opportunity for advocacy groups. This is what I used to do when I worked in nonprofit, help do a lot of grant writing. And you can do many things. You can assemble letters of support. You can go out and get testimonials from communities that would benefit from this project. You can help with the analysis and grant writing yourselves if the city will let you do that and lend a hand. There's a lot of different ways to get involved. And so I encourage you to work with city agencies uh, and help them, give them a hand and get after this funding. So grant funding opportunities. At the federal level, I think everybody's familiar back in November, President Biden signed the IIJA. If you were in the session this morning, Karen Whitaker did a really great job kind of over, giving an overview of what this new federal surface reauthorization bill does for us. We're gonna go a little bit into the, how do we get some of these programs? She gave a good overview on what they are. I've kind of distilled down what I think are the key things that we're gonna be paying attention to in this program. Some of them are formula grants, right? So they go directly to DOTs by formula. Some of them are discretionary. Discretionary means competitive. It means the grant programs that people need to write an application out for to get access to it. So the first one is the transportation alternatives, transportation alternatives program or transportation alternatives set aside. They've got many different names over the years. The biggest thing, 70% increase this morning in the session, they talked about how that number went up from getting about $70 million from the feds to I think 123 million from the feds to supplement in California our active transportation program. So what this just means is more money for uh, our program. Another one is the Congestion Mitigation Air Quality, CMAC funding. This is getting a small 10% increase, and that goes strictly to MPOs to manage. Here in the Bay Area, a lot of that money gets flowed through the OBAG, or the One Bay Area Grant Program, which will be coming out in May. Highway Safety Improvement Program. So a couple of new stipulations about this. Uh, California and all states that have greater than 15% of vulnerable road users, so people that walk or bike, uh, involved in severe collisions are now required to spend 15% of their funding through this formula on those vulnerable road users. What does this mean for California? So the Caltrans HSIP grants, they come out every year. A uh, program will just have more money, right, for bike and pet projects. And I'll get into more details about this one. And then the last one I'll just mention, this is a program that I think that uh, Kevin this morning at Rails to Trails was mentioning. It's the Active Transportation Infrastructure Investment Program. It was authorized in the IIJA bill, but it wasn't funded, right? And so that's what they were talking about. Rails to Trails Conservancy is leading a big national effort for Congress to go ahead and put some money towards this one. But this is just another discretionary grant program. So there's a lot of information here on the screen. I'm not gonna go through all of it and I don't want you to kind of have to read it at all, but there's some taglines. This is how I keep up with all of the different grant programs out here. So the RAISE grant, right? RAISE grant has had many different iterations. When I first started working in trails and bike and pet advocacy work in 2009, it was the Tiger Grant Program, and then it became the Build Grant Program under President Trump, and now it's the RAISE Program. It's a grant program that really is for large, complex, regionally significant projects. The minimum request is $5 million up to $25 million, All right. These things need political champions to be successful, and you need to find projects that are regionally significant. Because just think, this program is really heavily oversubscribed, and they only award maybe one or two projects per state. So they're also incredibly difficult to write these grants, right? So think about your project. Is it really a game changer, a transformative project for the region? Has it been vetted? Has it had a lot of political support? And can you find a political champion, member of Congress or your senator, to go up and say, I will fight for this project? All right, so that's what you need to think about when you're finding projects that are good, suitable ones for raise. Safe Streets and Roads for All. This is a brand new discretionary grant program. It was part of that IAJA. It's coming out very soon. The, the USDOT staff are writing the guidelines as we speak. And what I understand is that the notice of funding or the guidelines that say, hey, this program's open should be coming out next month. This program does really three things. It helps you develop a comprehensive safety plan or a vision zero plan. If you already have one, it'll give you funding to implement that plan, All right? So this is about five to $6 billion over the next five years. So another great opportunity to address known safety issues that you have already documented in a plan. HSIP, 
I mentioned this before, this is helping you resolve known safety issues with low cost infrastructure, right? The whole thing about this program is benefit cost ratio, right? So you wanna find areas where you've seen severe or fatal collisions in your community and then address them with low cost infrastructure. All right, it's really, there's a lot of different scoring criteria about this one, but this is the main one that's made to decisions. And again, this is gonna get more money through California and the Caltrans plant grant program. Uh, the NOFO or the notice of funding opportunity should be coming out uh, possibly spring or summer this year. Some other opportunities that are not a tie to federal funding, um, it's the American Rescue Plan, um, or I guess not tied to IHA, but the American Rescue Plan is one that I don't see a lot of communities really taking advantage of for active transportation or transportation in general. This is a formula program that goes to all counties, all jurisdictions, again, by formula that they can use to recover from the economic impacts of the coronavirus pandemic, right? And so there's a link here you can go on, it's treasury.gov. There have been two, there'll be two disbursements. The first one happened last May and the next one will be happening next month. And so again, talk with your city managers, talk with city council members about where they're gonna to go to, dis to distribute that funding. A lot of jurisdictions that I've talked to are backfilling, um, you know, positions that they weren't able to fund in the past or using it for a lot of public health concerns, obviously, about getting notice out about vaccines and public health concerns. But if there was a nexus between maybe your tourism being affected by the coronavirus, you could use it to possibly um, build new trails or build new trailheads or help support businesses that are adjacent to your active transportation infrastructure. Uh, unscheduled announcement that I realized uh, falls under this category. Um, for the, the state of California, there's a program that's launching right now. The draft guidelines are out called the uh, Regional, er, uh, Regional Early Action Planning, REAP, R-E-A-P 2.0. Um, and that program is funded through this program. Um, and that's money is at the state level run by the, or, uh, the Office of Planning and Research. And they're actually going to be distributing money at a block grant level to MPOs. So MPOs are metropolitan planning organizations, SCAG, MTC, things like that. Um, and they're getting a big chunk of money uh, where basically the MPOs are going to be getting this money to do what they want with it. There has to be a nexus to the recovery of COVID. And that includes that it needs to be regionally significant and it needs to be implementation, quote unquote. Uh, but it also funds regionally significant trail planning trail outreach and network planning. Um, and those funds are coming out, literally the, the MPOs are right now starting to write their applications of what they wanna do. So if you're an advocate and your target is one of the MPOs, um, look up REAP 2.0 uh, and you'll be able to find some information on that. It's a brand new program that's never existed before. It's still in the works. Honestly, we're all still actually figuring out exactly what is and isn't eligible. Um, so this is a really good time if you can look into it and you have someone at SCAG or MTC or any of your other MPOs um, or if you're from an area that doesn't have one of those, they're going to some of the COGS, uh, but something right there specifically that is directly going to be related to both housing and active transportation are two of the main factors. And transit is prohibited because they say the feds are saying transit already got too much money. So it's literally only option is housing and active transportation. So that's a program that's that's literally right now about to, to hit the road and, and the dollars are about to start flowing there. Great, thanks. Thanks, Mark. And again, I see folks taking pictures or scribbling things down. That's fine and well. We'll make sure that this slide deck's available, posted on the Summit website, or you can reach out to me, call our contact information afterwards. So I think the last one before we'll take a quick break and move on to my other uh, colleagues here on the panel, but something else that was a great welcome surprise, earmarks are back, right? We thought they were dead. People were asking me, my clients were saying, Jeff, should we go after an earmark? I said, no, it's dead. It's not going to come back. And then it was. So there's a lot of great resources out here. I'm not gonna rehash uh, some really great things, but I just wanna point you to a few links that I found really useful. Uh, there's a great webinar that Rails to Trails put out maybe about two weeks ago and uh, really dives into how to go about approaching the earmarking process. They're, they're not called earmarks anymore, right? Because that's not Vogue. So member designated transportation projects, all right? And so last year, members of Congress put out the request. You went online onto their project, under their um, office website, you filled out a small form, 
and they went through, they selected the ones that they were going to champion, and that made it into the last fiscal year 2022 budget, right? And so those are here. I've got links to the funded projects. Also, all of the requests are linked here. So if something didn't make it through and you're interested in maybe following up on that, you have now a full list of those projects. The key here, my tagline, start by speaking with your Congress member. Match their political needs with your project. This is political, right? There is no, there's no grant writer for these grants, right? It really is the ones there. Your members of Congress need to get reelected. They have to get reelected every two years. They're looking for projects that they can bring home to shore up votes, right? Let's just be as transparent and as possible about these. So your job in the audience is to find projects that would look good for them, right? So that's really how you mirror, mirror the two. So this is a really a purely political earmarking process, but it's another great way to get access to funding. All right, some state funds. The Urban Greening Program, Green Stormwater Infrastructure in partnership with disadvantaged communities. All right, this is really one where it needs to be a grassroots led effort, working with local environmental justice communities to think about tree planting, to think about trail projects, to think about green stormwater infrastructure uh, that really benefits those areas that have been disadvantaged. This is run by the California Natural Resources Agency. The deadline just passed in March, but it's an annual program. So it's a good one to start thinking about. Again, you need to find communities who have really voiced this need. I've worked with a lot of different jurisdictions that kind of comes from city staff. Those are much harder to shoehorn in. You really need to think about what does the community call out for as a need. Kind of the cousin to this program is the Transformative Climate Communities, the TCC program. It's run by Strategic Growth Council, represented right here by, um, by Mark, but this is $140 million grant size back in 2020. We think that there'll be another, uh, there's another grant deadline coming up in 2022. Again, very similar environmental justice communities shaping their future, all right, for reducing greenhouse gases and undoing and mitigating some of the effects of climate change. So once again, it's working directly in partnership with disadvantaged communities that are having a seat at the table and decision-making about how these grants are spent. Um, there's a multiple step process of getting this funding that you can go to the website and find out more. STP, the Sustainable Transportation Planning, it funds citywide corridor and trail plans. Right? So in order to be eligible for many of these grants, you need to have already gone through levels of design, you need to go through and make sure that the public is supportive of the project. In order to do that, you need to have funding out there for planning. This is a great resource to go to. It's an annual grant program. Some of the key winning themes are projects that benefit disadvantaged communities. Mode shift is probably the most underlying issue that Caltrans staff are looking at when they're making decisions. So these are really great for citywide transit projects, citywide active transportation plans or vision zero plans. Uh, really good for trail feasibility studies and corridor or complete streets projects. Any road diet that you need to go through that might be controversial, this is a great place to go to get funding to do all of the engagement you're going to need to do and traffic analysis. TDA, Article 3, the Transportation Development Act. This is a formula funding. Uh, cities and counties will get this funding. It's usually not very much unless you're a really large city. So my tagline here is formula funding for active transportation. Use it or bank it. You can continue to accrue this funding that comes to you over time, and eventually you might have enough to be a match for one of these bigger grants or save it up for a project that's a high priority. Local partnership program. This is through the SB1 funding from the uh, state gas tax funding. My tagline here, projects that need the final piece of funding. All right, so these need to be cost effective. The key thing here is deliverable. So shovel ready, this is really what they're looking for. There's two different aspects to this. Part of it is formula through the state that each jurisdiction is gonna get. And then part of it's a competitive grant program. The other things that they care about are safety projects, reducing VMT and greenhouse gas emissions. So bike and ped should score well in the statewide. But the key thing here is that there's already a good amount of match in hand, right? So they don't wanna be the first one in, they wanna be the last funder in. So you've already got a project, they just need a little bit more. This might be a good one to go after. Jeff, if I may. Yep. Uh, so a little bit on the local partnership program. This part, this program was established by the state to encourage partnership in funding. And so one of the core eligibility pieces of the local partnership program is that your county or your jurisdiction must already have a voter approved, uh, whether it's a sales tax, parcel fee, or toll in place. That way, um, uh, 
both parties are kind of coming to the table to complete a project. So if your county or your agency doesn't have any of that in place, then you will unfortunately are not eligible for this program. Thanks, Carl. OTS, off of traffic safety, education and encouragement campaigns and programs. All right, this is a, a program that comes out annually. There's no maximum amount, but the average grant, I went back and looked over it the last couple of years, it's about $250,000. And again, these are really wonderful for education campaigns, um, encouragement campaigns. They're great for partnerships to reduce historic crashes. So this is a, a wonderful grant program. A lot of cities have their police departments apply for this funding, and that's the way that they typically have done in the past, but it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. Um, I'm going to speak as, as myself here, not as a, uh, go, as a government employee. Um, OTS grants are, have like a 90% award rate. They're a really high award rate. They're small amount of money. The applications are actually very simple. They are really, really sucked up by police departments. And they even use this money to go ticket people for jaywalking. They use it to do bike stings. Uh, this is like a tapped fund for those of you that are advocates who want to help see um, police reform and want to see other forms of enforcement and other forms of traffic safety. It's a small amount of money. It just takes some partnership with the local agency and say, like, instead of giving $250,000 so some cops can go stand on a corner and get overtime and ticket people for crossing mid-block, give it to us, help our community, and really bring that forward. Um, and it's public health agencies can apply for it and other agencies. I think this is one of those things that really is, as a, as a former advocate back in my day, um, this is such an underutilized amount of money where it can really help your budget. You know, $200,000 to any of your local uh, advocacy organizations can go a long way to do the work that you're already gonna do. And taking that money away from the police, doing it for not the right reasons, absolutely OTS is like such a great aspect there. And it's literally a, a checkbox of like, we'll do this, we'll do that. We'll do a bike rodeo, we'll do bike education classes. We'll do, you know, that. And the police saying, yeah, we'll do all those things. And then they don't. So I just, to, to say that. OTS has to be funded by us. The question was if the advocacy groups can apply for it. No, but the advocacy groups can apply for the RFP if the city receives it. Um, my, my partner works for the LA County Department of Public Health. Every year they get money for this and they re redistribute that money to Los Angeles walks, to Los Angeles County Bicycle Coalition and other things like that. Um, so you can find, just find a sympathetic person at a public health agency or transportation agency to really bug that forward. But there's, this is like such an easy, easy win to really shore up your budget for a year. Great. I think it's the last one. So we'll pause here. That's a lot. I just shared with you a ton of different avenues to go through. Uh, and then we're going to go to some deeper dive about two really wonderful grant programs, the AHSC and ATP. So any questions in the audience? If there are questions, I'm going to walk to you. I'm going to put the microphone up to your mouth because we're recording it. There's friends. Wave to everybody at home. There's friends at home joining us. So, oh, ha all right. That was kind of your first set. Yeah, sure. All right, questions. Yeah, right in the back. Thank you all so much. It's such good information. Uh, question about funding cycle times, like mm -hmm. how, were these two-year intervals or these four-year intervals? Um, and then I guess the follow-up question to that is in terms of approaching cities to partner for, for example, the last grant that you just referenced, um, is there etiquette to that? Mm -hmm. Great question. So in my slides here, our slides, we've outlined kind of what the, you know, the cycles. A lot of them are annual. Some of them are biannual every, every other year. Um, some of them are like OBAG, right? It's just kind of when the funding comes through. Could be every four or five years, but most of them are annual. And about reaching out, the proper etiquette, I think just the relationships that you maybe you've built as an advocacy group over time, finding the staff person that you've got a good relationship to and offering and saying, hey, this is coming. It's Try and get out as early on as possible and see, you know, we'd like to go after this funding. What are you thinking about? Um, city council members are another good one to talk to early on. You know, six months in advance is probably the right time at least. <laughs> so other questions about Aaron? Thank you very much. Um, logistically, when you add these to the website, et cetera, make this uh, chart, et cetera, available, uh, will you include also which of these grants are required to have the approval and or uh, review by 
bicycle advisory committees, pedestrian advisory, advisory committees, et cetera, is one of the check mark boxes, just to make it easier for those groups to really become involved and know that they have a say in these uh, grants. It's a good, it's a really good question. We won't be able to do that because each city has their own different way of having involvement of their bicycle and pedestrian advisory committees or commissions or complete streets commissions. It's really up to each city about how they go about involving the community in making these decisions. But I think the best thing you can do is find members of council who are going to be the ones really making a decision to receive or go after this funding. So that's where I'd start. And some do require resolutions. Yeah. Okay. So this is a little higher level, more in terms of um, how how many money is distributed and how those of us who are in um, the less densely populated parts of the state can work this. So for example, any we're the least densely populated county in the Bay Area. So we have fewer taxpayers per mile of road, but any of the formula things go out per population, not by mile of roads. And then the competitive things rightly so, are giving more weight to projects that are serving disadvantaged communities, which ours are sort of scattered amongst the things. So I guess the question is how to find a creative way to navigate that to still get our, the, our needs met when it seems like the two ways of divvying up money are sort of stacked against us. It's a, it's a good question and something that I've unfortunately struggled with a lot. A lot of clients come and say, we want to either they're in affluent areas and, but still maybe through, you know, Prop 13, they don't have the tax resources, even though their property values are very high, they don't have the, the funding to do a lot of these things or in rural areas. And so there are some grant programs that I've mentioned here that aren't tied to disadvantaged communities like HSIP is really certainly a good one if you have safety issues, right? If you can really key in on that, that's one where it's, it's definitely more by the benefit cost analysis that I mentioned. Um, there, there is a federal, you know, Karen Whitaker this morning was mentioning uh, a rural, um, I guess a rural transportation project that I'd like to look into more. I don't know enough about that, um, but I don't know if you've got other ideas, Carl or, or Mark here to help with. Yeah, Eris, I was just gonna say, you're kind of getting ahead of me a little bit. Yeah. Um, so something that MTC is trying to do, uh, I mean, cause our whole goal is to try and get as much state dollar, I mean, as much money in general to the Bay Area for, for any type of improvement. And in the active transportation space, since um, the predominant funding program is the active transportation program, we're trying to explore opportunities to make it easier for jurisdictions to apply, trying to help them come up with unique ways to qualify as a disadvantaged community um, in a certain way and, and encouraging them to like start doing primary data collection where there are pockets within larger uh, areas where that wouldn't qualify as a disadvantaged community. Um, so we're, we're starting to think about that, trying to work within the, the guidelines that exist to, to help our jurisdictions. Yeah. Let's take one more and then we'll keep going on. We'll do more Q and A. So if you can't get to you, we'll, we'll save it. Anybody else want to ask a question now? All right, I think we turn things over. Let's see where we are to me. All right, Carl, you're up next. You want the clicker? All right, uh, so we have a lot of people file in during uh, the first part of the presentation. And so I just wanna take a, a quick poll of the room again. Uh, who's representing a nonprofit organization? And uh, what about a government agency or a city, something like that? All right, and private sector? Okay, so distribution's still about the same with a little bit more private sector folks. Uh, and so again, I'm Carl Anderson with the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, the Bay Area Metropolitan Planning Organization. Uh, I manage state funded programs um, for MTC and one of which is the active transportation program. Uh, the active transportation program was established in 2013 um, by the California Transportation Commission and it essentially consolidated a lot of the uh, siloed little buckets of active transportation funding and now created a competitive program for the state. Um, so this, this is a snapshot of what the current cycle looks like. Uh, the, the ATP program is a four-year program that is adopted every two years, and we are in the middle or we're at the beginning of ATP cycle six. And ATP cycle six applications are due later this summer on June 15th. And here's a snapshot of the uh, federal fund or of the state fiscal years that funding is available and how the distribution of funding is split up. So the active transportation um, pot of money is split into three categories. 50% of the funds is managed by the state 
uh, which is the CTC, where they evaluate their, uh, the whole pool of projects and award funding. They're, there's 325 million available in that pot of funding. 10% uh, of the overall program is um, what's called the state, or sorry, the small urban and rural program. Uh, so 10% of the overall funding goes to uh, jurisdictions and counties that um, are outside of a MPO. Um, and that pot of money is the light blue color here at the bottom, which would be $65 million, which is available there. And then the remaining $260 million goes to the 10 large MPOs throughout the state for them to manage their own regional competitive program. And so my role at MTC, I manage MTC's regional competitive program. For our share, we have $55 million available this cycle. Um, historically, projects that have been successful are highly cost-effective. They include projects that are closing some sort of gap in your city or county's um, biker or pedestrian network. Projects that prioritize significant safety improvements. So if there's a, a project that um, will actually alleviate some sort of safety concern or an area where there's a significant amount of crashes, those really score well in the ATP program. And uh, projects that are um, a combination of infrastructure and non-infrastructure uh, programming. So projects where you are implementing some sort of new improvement in your community, and then you're coupling that with some sort of education or outreach um, initiative to, you know, show your community how to use it. Um, and additionally, the other project types that have historically scored well are complete street style projects where you're accommodating all users on the, on the road network or the pedestrian or the bike network. Now I say historically because ATP is a very oversubscribed program which has now made it extremely competitive. And so as project sponsors are trying to figure out the ATP, my message to you today is that the engineering itself no longer tells the full story. That will not get your project scored. What matters is your engagement with your community, you telling the state and MTC about how this improvement was actually called for upon by your community. They were engaged and involved in the development of this project and how it's actually gonna benefit their daily life. Um, those projects that are starting to tell that story, craft that narrative, are what we're, what we're starting to see being funded in the active transportation program. Um, since we're on the sixth cycle, we've seen pro pro projects increase in cost, uh, seen projects, uh, well, because projects are increasing in cost, the state and MTC are funding fewer projects, which may be a good thing, maybe a bad thing. I mean, it's kind of hard to tell until we get more money in the program. Um, and so, since that's the state of the ATP right now, I, I kind of want to talk about in my next set of slides about well, A, what makes your project successful, but also what is MTC doing or what are other people doing and what can you do to help jurisdictions um, navigate this new funding arena? And so one of our newly started initiatives we started in cycle five um, was to actually implement some sort of technical assistance to jurisdictions like jeff alluded to in the be very beginning comments is that city staff are overstaffed they're not here today they're not here to digest digesting all this information you the advocates are and so we're doing our best to reach out to jurisdictions that need some support or need some application grant writing assistance to help them navigate what looks good on their application or what type of project even looks good or encouraging them to reach out to your NGO or their local advocacy organization and their community to get a project that works for the community that can actually score well. Um, there is a lot of text on these slides. Feel free to take pictures. Um, we'll make sure we'll get this um, to you, but there are also hyperlinks in this section. And so the second bullet here includes two uh, best practices resources that MTC published about uh, I guess uh, nine months ago. And one of them is um, uh, an infographic that shows you um, where you should be in your application development timeline if you are gonna pursue ATP as a grant for your community. Um, I don't know if this has a laser. I don't see it, but anyways. And essentially, we, we're right here. Call for projects has already gone out and jurisdictions should be working on their application. Now, for this moment, you as advocacy organizations or nonprofit organizations should be reaching out to your city and saying, hey, are you considering ATP? If so, what can I do to help work on your application? Do I need to connect you to any sort of community? Do you, have you done your public engagement? Um, what types of meetings have taken place? All those questions, that's, who you need, that's what you need to be asking kind of in this moment. Um, and if, if 
if you're not there or if the city that you're working with isn't there, then start at square, start at square one and start thinking about ATP cycle seven or ATP cycle eight. Um, the other uh, handout that we published recently was what are MTC Bay Area best practices. So the active transportation prioritizes investment in disadvantaged communities. The Bay Area proportionally to the rest of the state doesn't have as many disadvantaged communities under the current metrics that exist in the active transportation program. And so that's one of our perennial issues in the Bay Area. And so we compiled some resources or just some basic kind of narratives to help you uh, think about that question a little bit more um, robustly. So if, whether that is actually doing primary data collection for certain um, pockets of your community that um, doesn't qualify in a larger disadvantaged community. So like up, up in wine country, so Sonoma and Napa where we have pockets of very low income day laborers that live in very, uh, I, don't, I don't know, like the best way to describe it, sorry, um, where there were in areas where there's aren't even sidewalks. I mean, if you show in your application that say, hey, we have this pocket community, yes, it's in Napa Valley or it's in Sonoma Valley, but these are the people that are actually going to and from work every day. If you show that in your application, then you can actually provide a constructive narrative saying that this investment from the state will improve lives of the disadvantaged community members in our jurisdictions. Uh, now to the technical side of the piece of the application. This may sound obvious, but you really got to reach out to your jurisdictions that are applying and making sure that they are doing all of it. Make sure they're answering every question as thoroughly as possible. Make sure they're not cutting and pasting responses from one question to the next and making sure that they are reading their rubric on what they're being scored on. Um, and then one other thing that is super helpful is adding as much information as possible. Just because there's not a box that asks for photos doesn't mean you can't add photos of your community using some derelict infrastructure or adding data, adding maps, showing pictures of your outreach events and including all of that. That way you're telling a holistic version of what your community needs and how it'll improve their day-to-day -day lives. And then number four, proofread the application. <laughs> it sounds obvious, but there are critical errors that may mess up the whole narrative of your, of your question uh, or of your application. Uh, yeah, and, and this is just kind of some summary points about what makes a successful applicant. Um, I, I'm not going to go through and read all this stuff, but one of the other things that I do want to highlight here is making sure that your project or that your um, community's project is aligning with both state and regional goals. Um, that's something that changes every, you know, few years with a new administration or anything like that. And one of the things that we're seeing, um, at least with this cycle, is uh, the governor's impetus to draw a connection or a nexus with affordable housing or low-income housing in your community. So, yes, your project may be in a disadvantaged community, but are you also connecting that project to uh, something that is going to benefit an affordable housing development or have a nexus with a low-income community? in a specific area of, of your city. Um, the other efforts that we're seeing pop up in guidelines are, um, well, the recently adopted CAPTI, uh, which is the California Action Plan for Transportation, or wait, I have a state partner, Climate, Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure. There it is, okay, sorry. Uh, and, and that is identifying all sorts of uh, goals to um, align transportation investments with uh, greenhouse gas emission goals and, and better climate outcomes. Um, and so we're starting to see more, uh, uh, more of an emphasis on that in the ATP application. Um, let's see. And again, answer all questions and sub questions, review all the application material and scoring rubrics, and that should put you in a, a decent place. Uh, this is the, the timeline of the uh, current cycle. Uh, most notably here is that June 15th is, that de is the deadline, which is 68 days away. Um, so if you are already engaged with uh, your jurisdictions, awesome. If you're not, get in their door right after this talk. <laughs> um, or if something isn't quite ready yet, then start communicating with them to talk about projects um, for cycle seven, cycle eight. Uh, here in the presentation, I've consolidated some resources, um, both from at the state level, so the CTC's active transportation webpage, Caltrans's active transportation webpage, where they kind of outline a lot of more of the technical resources. Um, the Active Transportation Resource Center is funded by the ATP, and that is a state-level resource center that provides 
flash trainings or um, additional resources to help you navigate the ATP, whether it's the application or project delivery, those types of things. And then finally, the MTC ATP webpage, um, where you'll find resources um, about um, disadvantaged communities in the Bay Area, um, which we uh, refer to as equity priority communities, were formerly known as communities of concern. And we also have a technical assistance page where you'll find those two documents I outlined before and any um, resources um, for the upcoming uh, calls for projects. Okay, thanks, Carl. That was a great rundown of ATP. One other thing I'll just mention, uh, CTC does a really wonderful job of posting all of their scoring rubrics and it puts you in the mind of the reviewer. All right, it gives you all of the different things that you'll be scored on. And it, it's the instructions for the reviewer. So you need to really download this. This is when I work with my staff on grant writing. We download that and that is our Bible, right? We really follow that religiously because we want every point is precious in this grant program. So you really need to take a look at that. Uh, let's, let's go to questions here. Yep, I'll uh, see over here. That's okay, that's okay. Um, what role does data play in um, any of these applications? How important is it to demonstrate? Obviously demonstrating ROI is important, but um, yeah. So yeah, data is definitely a big part of the active transportation program. I'll speak to that first, and Jeff, I don't know if you want to speak mm -hmm. about any of the other programs, uh, but uh, in the active transportation application, um, the biggest section where you're showing a lot of your community data is uh, uh, the, the crash and safety data. Um, that's um, there are a lot of questions are asked there. Another part where you can include a lot of data is your public engagement question, where you're actually showing and cataloging um, the quantity, the amount of times that you've been engaging with your community and how many people have been participating. Um, and I think those are the two pieces where data show up the most. Um, trying to think through the whole application. For yeah, so you, yeah, for the crash, for the safety chapter, uh, <laughs> chapter, that's how big the application is. Uh, accessing your Switters database, accessing these Switters database to pull in any sort of crash and safety information. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so data is, I think, critical, kind of a piece of this, and analyzing the data is, is helpful in telling the story. Uh, TIMS, which is the transportation, was it traffic? Uh, Berkeley has TIMS, you go on TIMS, it pulls the Switters data, it's all the collisions, right? And there is an ATP specific program that makes it really easy to pull down your crash data and it already sums it up. It's a, something you can append to an application. So crash data is available, disadvantaged communities. There's a lot of different publicly available resources out there. Cal Enviro Screen 4.0, the Healthy Places Index are easy to follow and you just type in your community that you're working in and you can find kind of how it, how it fits through that. Uh, some of the larger ones I mentioned earlier, some of those federal grants do require, like the RAISE grant requires like a benefit cost analysis. And that's really why I mentioned it's so expensive. It's doing a lot of that heavy lifting of analysis. Hold on, hold on. I, I asked because we are in kind of a liaise position wherein um, we create programs working with advocacy and also jurisdictions of a whole bunch of different sizes, but often we get questions like, or we hear, we don't know where to get the funding from, we don't know what the documentation needs are, and so because what we do does document a whole bunch of stuff, it's helpful for us to know so that we can talk to our communities effectively and advise them, the cities and advocacy, so thanks. Other questions? Yes, right here. I, I live in the city of Pinole, uh, just a small city, and I've been advocating for years that the city be more active about applying for grants. And my experience has always been, uh, I'll ask, I'll give the city a heads up, a grant's coming up, and typically the city will respond and say, well, we don't have the staff, we, we don't have the bandwidth to apply for grants. So very rarely does the city even apply for grants, but when they do, it, it, there's no, you made it sound like there's a lot of collaboration between residents and activists in the city or advocates and staff, uh, which is hopeful to me, but I, I always assumed that that wasn't appropriate. And so I didn't, they made it made me feel like it wasn't appropriate that, that let them do their job, leave them alone. And, and I didn't feel like the people that were advocating for these sorts of things in the community were really welcome to be part of the process, but you're making it sound like it could be more collaborative. Yeah, I would say that's uh, traditionally how 
just departments of transportation and public works departments had operated. And, and what I am trying to express today is that we need to change that because that's not working. And so my, my role at MTC has been telling cities like, hey, if you want this funding, you start need, you really need to reach out to your community and start talking with them about what their needs are, not just about what you think is best for your, your capital improvement plan. And, and so I, I also do wanna say that it's not just the city that can apply, you can also um, get in partnership with uh, your uh, local school district or a public health organization, and, and then you can jointly apply with the city. So if you, that could be another opportunity or way for you to make inroads to get an application on the books and say, hey, look, I've partnered with, the, with our public health department or our school district. We need you to, to help deliver the project, but hey, we'll write the application. We'll, we'll put it all together, but they still need to be at the table for it. Hey, thank you. Um, so I work with, I'm a tenant rights advocate in uh, San Francisco. I work with, uh, in public housing um, and with the Hope SF project. So it's the massive redevelopment of all public housing or the four biggest sites of public housing in San Francisco. One of the things is that as these sites have been redeveloped, they're dramatically dropping parking spaces. Um, and so forcing residents to figure out what do you do. Um, and, uh, at two of the sites that have already been redeveloped, this is becoming like a really big issue where tenants are like, what the hell? Um, I started working with tenants on bike riding. And so uh, we also have a very really good um, relationship with like local city supervisors, et cetera, and staff. Um, but would that be something in terms of like getting a whole like integrated program of like getting cargo bikes, getting electrified bikes, et cetera, into public housing uh, for tenants? as this shift is happening with the redevelopment. Is that something like this could be that, would that correlate, does that work well with this writing? So the active transportation program doesn't fund bike purchases. Um, of the list of programs that Jeff had presented and that I am thinking of in my head right now, I can't identify one uh, state or federally sponsored program that does fund bike purchases. Um, I do know, or does. Oh, AHC that. does, in a few minutes, we'll, we'll talk about it there. Um, but I do know that there are um, private party, private entities that do do that. And I, I don't think anyone's really done a, a consolidation of what funding programs exist in the private sector for active transportation improvements. Um, but I, I, I have a feeling there's some out there. And we'll let Mark talk about the AHC program in a bit. I, I will just say directly to your question, I can't remember who funded it, but I know the city of Santa Monica has a, this is not my work currently, but um, that there's a zero emissions program in the city of Santa Monica that involved buying like pedicabs and electric bikes for deliveries and um, seniors having access. So I know however they funded it uh, was, and it was funded by a state, I believe a state program. Um, so are you from Santa Monica and answer, have the answer to that? Oh, yeah. hold on, hold on. Yeah, we'll get to the mic. Just one second. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. No, there are people online, so you're gonna. Uh, there's lots of programs if you get creative across the state and at the federal level that you can pay for bike share purchases and also for um, uh, particularly e-bikes. I think it's a hot area right now. I think they're the, the um, cap and trade funding that's, I don't know what the acronym is, but is um, in Los Angeles, there was, there's funding that's actually just being used today uh, for purchasing e-bike um, for e-bike library. So there are, there are opportunities. Uh, we can talk later if you want to, <laughs> you want a list. I think it's a, I think it's a really timely question because I'm getting clients right now asking about e-bike subsidies. We're, we're working with San Mateo County, uh, which also does not score typically well for ATP. They have a self-help tax measure and they're using some of it to fund through their TDM call for projects. Uh, a couple e-bike subsidy programs. So I think we're gonna see a lot more of that. And it's probably something we need to, to take a look at. Other questions for ATP. Is there a limit of how many applications an agency can submit and score well on? Uh, there is a limit on how many they can score well on. <laughs> That's the funding limit. Uh, but no, there's not a limit on how many applications a city can submit or a request size, as long as it doesn't exceed the amount available. Great, other questions? Yes. Uh, my question was just about the the funding that you listed at the beginning, like the the split. I'm just wondering how does that fit into like Governor Newsom's 500 500 million extra into this? 
So I will say that there are two proposals that have been identified by Governor Newsom to um, augment the active transportation program by $500 million independently. Uh, one of which was identified in his draft, draft January budget proposal. Um, there was $750 million identified for active transportation improvements, 500 million of which would go to the active transportation program, another 150 million for a pilot program funding uh, bike highways or bike boulevards. Um, that is just up in the air until the budget is actually adopted. So that will require negotiations with the legislature before we actually know if that's gonna hit the ATP. Uh, the other one, uh, admittedly, I don't know too much about, but um, is a separate um, initiative proposed by uh, Governor Newsom to augment the program by $500 million. Um, and I think that that is going to require a separate legislative action. I think it's its own kind of like standalone bill. I don't know if anyone in the crowd knows otherwise, if uh, that's right or not. Um, but it's just kind of, it's up in the air until it's a reality. And if that... Um, does actually hit the program, then it'll follow the same funding split and funding distribution um, as um, is already outlined in the legislation. Let's uh, let's go on to Mark's session and then we'll do more Q&A. How about that? All right, hi everybody, Mark Caswell. Um, and we'll get started in one second. Uh, just a heads up for those of you, especially um, Kent, I think especially you, um, the I, I many years ago signed up to be a volunteer reviewer for the active transportation program. Um, I just checked in with, with the staff and they said, yeah, they're looking for more volunteer reviewers. It's a really interesting thing. You get paired up with somebody who doesn't live near you. You review 10 to 15 applications that are not in your area. Um, and you kind of start from scratch and learn about that and you rank them and they get so many that they need volunteer folks. So um, I'm not sure if the websites, if there's still a place. I know I actually found out about it from Streets Blog back many years ago. Um, and I always recommend folks that if you wanna learn how the sausage gets made, volunteer and you can actually help make that sausage and then you know how to write a better one in the future. Both um, at the state and regional level. So I'm looking for volunteers for anyone in the MTC area or in the Bay Area, and then the state is looking for anyone across the state. And it's, <laughs> and it's like, it's like 50-ish hours over the period of like a month and it's a long day. You come home from work and you're like, all right, I got to open this one, which to that end of your comment about data, I'll just say, good to have a lot of data, good to have a lot of information. Also, don't waste people's time by adding a ton of junk because they literally are volunteers and they're people who are doing this because they care. They're people like you. They're people who work at government agencies, nonprofits, and things like that. So you always want to kind of be succinct, clear. Um, is really a key factor there. But I would say, um, I don't know, Lori, should I, they come talk to you if they want to sign up? So yeah, and consultants are prohibited, just a heads up, because okay. I got kicked out when no I private became sector. a consultant. <laughs> All right, so Mark Caswell, uh, I'm with the Strategic Growth Council. Um, for those of you that weren't in the room earlier, Strategic Growth Council is part of the Office of Planning and Research, which is part of the governor's office. Um, so I'm three levels in and a lot of acronyms there. Um, and I'm speaking today to about the Affordable Housing Sustainable Communities Program. Uh, AHSC is what we call it the state. Um, some people call it ASIC, but we call it AHSC. Um, so AHSC uh, is a program that is funded by the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, um, which the, the, someone had mentioned earlier. Um, about 20% of the cap and trade funds that are related to uh, pollution, 20% of that funds the Affordable Housing Sustainable Communities Program. It's about $500 million a year. Last year, it was 800 million because we mushed two years together. This year, we're expecting it to be 500, but similar to ATP, there's another 300 million that is in the governor's budget that if approved by the legislature, will put us back to 800 million. Um, so that's a lot of money and every year. We're on, round, we're on uh, round seven right now because ours is annual while ATP is every other year. Um, so the program is managed by the Strategic Growth Council in partnership with the Housing and Community Development Program uh, HCD and the California Air Resources Board. Because it is funded by Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, um, reducing greenhouse gases is a key component there um, and a really important aspect. And this was one of the challenges when we created the cap and trade fund at the state of California. Um, we said, you know, one of the things we need to do is by building affordable housing near transit and near key destinations where people can walk and bike and take transit safely is one of the best ways to reduce GHGs. So rather than using the money to fund some other programs, you know, desalination or whatever, this is a really important way to really bring an urban planning um, transportation focus to the program and bring that forward. And we all know that we're in a housing crisis. 
We're all in, we're in a climate crisis, we're in a housing crisis, and we're in a traffic safety crisis. And this really hits all three of those, which is why I'm really proud of the program and proud to be a partner uh, working on this. So uh, I'm gonna go into some detail of how the program works and what you need for the program. And then I'll talk a little bit about how uh, communities can access this and build upon this. Um, so as I said, uh, it's about 500 to 800 million dollars a year. The uh, ask, the maximum ask is 30 million dollars per project. 20 million of that goes to the housing. 10 million of that goes to biking, walking, transit. So when you're applying, you have to be a, in partnership with a developer and as the local jurisdiction that's going to build the biking, walking, um, and maybe the transit agency to do the transit, maybe not. Um, and then it also does fund programs, um, including community bike purchases, bike share, uh, bike education programs, things like that in there. Um, it's kind of like, hey, you're building affordable housing, you have to build 50% of the AMI. And then if you add some bike lanes, you get points. And if you add some transit and you get some GHG reductions, you get points. And if you add some community programs, you get points. And there's a way to get more and more points up to a hundred point scale, similar to ATP, um, but there's a hundred point scale there. So again, I mentioned, you know, we've had this number, you can see it's grown and grown and grown year over year. Um, as I mentioned, round six was kind of two years combined um, because of COVID, there was some delays there. And so we had to mush it together. Um, and we're just starting round seven. Round six was awarded in, uh, in January. Um, so the overarching goal is that we're intending to reduce GHG emissions um, since the funding comes from GGRF. There's a couple statutory requirements. 50% of the funding has to go to disadvantaged communities. I realize we've used that word a lot here, but we didn't really unpack what that is. Um, for most programs, I believe for ATP, um, there's a Senate bill 535 that made a thing called the Cal Enviro screen. And that has a map that tells you what percentile of pollution burden you are uh, by the census tract. And so there's a census tract level or a city level. And if you're in the top 75th percentile, then you are considered a disadvantaged community. Um, it is not a based on income plays a factor in there, pollution plays a factor in there. There's a lot of different categories in there. So there's a lot of talk of DACs or DACs. Um, to this end, 50% has to be spent in the disadvantaged community and 50% of the funding has to go towards housing. We also are required to do one tribal project. Um, we usually only get one a year. So if you can get a tribal project, you're probably gonna win. As long as you score at least a minimum of like a, a a D, you have to get like 60 points to do that. So um, we're trying to encourage more tribal. If you're with a tribal entity and you wanna talk, please come and talk to me because I wanna really work on that. Um, and then we also have to do these eight geographic regions. It's a weird breakdown. It is not tied to MPO, it's tied in a different way. Uh, this is something that was established by the council to help really spread this. It's a statewide program. We really don't wanna only be funding in dense areas. Um, round six uh, awards, the map's really hard to see. But you can see those green dots across the state there. You can see that there's a lot of projects that were funded. We awarded a total of 36 projects uh, this coming, this cycle. Um, I couldn't remember if it was 36 or 37, um, each of which was, you know, 72 million for Central Coast, 255 million for Los Angeles and Orange County. Um, Bay Area got $278 million. This was all last year. Um, this happened in January. Out of 53. Yeah, so only 53 applied and 36 got it. This is not to, not to, not just malign ATP. I used to write ATP, but there's like a 10% success rate. Um, it's really hard to win in ATP, but when it comes to AHSC, it's a more than 50% success rate. We smooth, you know, we doubled together. So it's usually around 20 to 30. This is why I brought Mark here. All right. It's because I think a lot of our conversations is all about ATP. It takes up a lot of the room. This is a program that my clients rarely come to me and ask about, but I've been telling and trying to spread the word and hopefully we can evangelize you to go out and spread the word as well. Thanks, Jeff. And on top of that, it's funding affordable housing and it's funding transportation, which are like, as, a, as many years ago, the Transform organization in here from Transform today, you know, they always used to say, uh, you know, active transportation and affordable housing is peanut butter and chocolate. They go good together. They're both great, but they're even better together. Um, and so I, I stole that from them many years ago, but we awarded, you know, this is, this is actually, our, we actually awarded $808 million last year, which is a huge number. And we're doing that year over year over year, awarding millions of dollars here for housing and transportation. So how do we get there? 
So this is actually a project that is built. This is not a stock photo. I know it looks like it, um, but that is actually a project called Springhaven. It's in the Willowbrook community of, of Los Angeles in the unincorporated county. Unincorporated can apply, tribal folks can apply. Um, you need to have, uh, the housing has to be 50% area median income. That can be calculated with a couple at rate, at market rate units, and then a bunch of extremely low income, low income. They just need to have a funding mix of 50%. I'm not a housing person. I don't really understand that 50% AMI, but the developers figure that out. Um, there are a lot of developers out there, link housing, meta housing, bridge housing. Um, there's a million of these groups out there that are doing, especially the nonprofit affordable housing organizations. They would love to get another $20 million for their project and be able to get that up and over their thing. Um, you have to have three of the four sides have to be developed already. We're not building sprawl. This is infill. This is about saying we're doing it here and we're doing it where there's already existing. So empty lots are especially important if you as a community know that. Um, and then the housing has to be within a half mile of a transit line. There's kind of different categories of which one you can fall into this program. If it's higher than 15 minute headways during peak hour, you're a TOD. Uh, if it's less than 15 minute headways, but still fat, but still often it's another category. And then there's a rural category as well, because we got to spread the love around the whole state since it's a state program. Um, and the density level is usually like 30 units per acre. If you're rural, it's 15 per acre, which is still a lot, but not as much. Um, but so there's a lot of that. And because I know Robert Prince, who's not in the room, has mentioned this before, I just want to specify, it requires that there's at least one bike parking spot for every two units. So we're requiring bike parking in all these affordable housing units. That's a baseline. You don't get points for that. You got to do it. Um, you also have to, the, the, the challenge for all of us in this room is that the developer has to have 90% of their funding already established. They have to know where they want to build. They have to have a design for it. They have to have that property as owned. And they have to say, yeah, we got about 90% of our funds and we're going to tip it over with 20%. And they can go and apply for other funds after that. But a developer is really important here. Um, and I know some folks bristle at talking about developers, but we're talking about developers for affordable housing and a lot of nonprofit affordable housing. And as I said, they get 20 million. And then the local jurisdiction gets the other 10 million to do the biking, walking uh, and other stuff there. There's also trees and some other things. Um, and the best part about it is like, I'm a planner. I hate being a planner. I want to be a doer. I've done everything I can to stop saying like, I want to write another plan and put it on a shelf and have no one actually implement it in 10 years. And it just sits there and collects dust. The thing with this is if you get the money, you have to build it within five years. And I was in a meeting literally once where a developer was sitting there with an unnamed transit agency. And they said, well, but what if you don't end up building that bike lane? What if enough people complain and cry about the bike lane and say, no, don't take away my parking. And you guys decide not to build the bike lane. Um, like, you know, what's going to happen if we built the housing, we want our 20 million. Um, and the developer looked and smiled and said, well, then we'll just sue you. <laughs> it's like, you know, like, and it was like, oh crap, okay. And then the city's now going to pay 20 million to the developer to do that. Um, that was, it was it's kind of scary, um, but it's really great because it's like you're binding your hand together. You're in a joint liability agreement and you have to build it within five years. Um, and that's, I think, and the thing is they can build the bikeway or the sidewalks or the transit quickly and then the housing can be built, but everything's got to be done by five years. As I said, it's great to do planning. It's great to do engineering and design work, but like I'm ready to see things on the ground. Um, we all have good ideas. Let's get them built. So as I mentioned, 100 points score, 30 points go to your greenhouse gas reductions. Uh, dirty secret here, biking and walking have very minimal GHG reductions compared to buses. Um, a, buying a new bus, taking a diesel bus, off the road that's operating 12 hours a day, polluting a lot, taking one bus and making it electric, and looking at the number of people that are served on that bus compared to how many people are served by a new sidewalk or a bike lane, it ends up blip there. That's the way the data shows from the greenhouse gas reduction. So, um, so that is always a challenge, but we require you have to build bike lanes to get points. Um, so 30 points for greenhouse gas, 15 for narrative, um, you know, as Carl was mentioning, it's about getting that right and really telling the story there. And then 55 points for other policies. That includes like this coming year, we're going to have things like, you know, internet access for the residents of the units. We're going to have, you know, digital literacy programs, anti-displacement strategies, um, how many bike lanes you're building. If you're building trees, if you're putting in bus shelters, a lot of things like that. And you get extra points for all of those. Um, you have to have, if 25% of your funding is for bike walk, you get six points. So that's a big chunk of money that you're really like, finding a way to do that really helps. If you're just building the housing, you're not gonna win. You're gonna get 
30 to 40, maybe 50 points there. So you've got to do this bike walk stuff. So finding a way to connect those two there is really important. And you have to build at least a half mile of context sensitive bikeway. Just want to acknowledge, like we talk about building bikeways and building a mile of bikeway. And that can mean like Sharrow's on a 45 mile an hour street. No, we don't do that. Um, and this year I'm actually going to, I believe we're getting rid of Sharrow's only. They won't even be considered anymore as considered a legitimate bikeway. Sharrow's only is not. Like I said, I literally said, I said that'll be my applause line. So like, no, do you want to, if you're doing Sharrow's, I want to see some real road diets. I want to see some real reductions in like, you know, improved um, roundabouts and things like that. So we're going to make it harder to get because Sharrow's are cheap and they're not very effective. Um, so we're building that forward in a big way. And some people are going to push back on that. So please speak up if you're uh, there. So um, project milestones, we're right now about to have our second round of stakeholder sessions. These are people who've applied before um, and we're building that forward. If you wanna be involved, ahsc at sgc.ca.gov. I know it's terrible, just Google it also. We're about to release a policy paper where we're laying out things like that Shero concept. Um, and then the draft guidelines will be released in May to August and come October of this year is when the NOFA will be released. So right now, if you're trying to get involved in this right now, it's a little earlier than ATP. Um, what we're really trying to do is if you know someone who is in your city and they're saying, geez, there's not enough money to implement the things in our bike plan, they need to go talk to their people across the hallway in the housing department and say, do you know a housing project that's getting built that's affordable housing that would like to have $20 million? Awesome. How about we get them $20 million, we get me $10 million and we build the bikeway and you can bring that together there. So you're bringing them money. They just need to go talk to their partners in the housing department. We all know we wanna build affordable housing. And so it's really good to bring that together. And I think I'm at time. I will just say to the DAC question, and this is where things get a little tricky. One of, the one of the things that we're trying to do is not over-concentrate poverty. So by building affordable housing in low-income communities is concentration of poverty. Simultaneously, giving a bunch of money to rich, higher income, high opportunity areas uh, is also kind of a sticky situation, but our program does not give you points for being a disadvantaged community. So folks who are saying they're not in a disadvantaged community, but want to build affordable housing in these high opportunity areas, you actually will benefit this program over other programs because of that. Uh, we don't give you points for being that, but it is a really interesting balance there. Um, and as I said, we have to do 50% in disadvantaged community, but we also have to build in high resource communities and it's a directly at odds. Uh, direct contradiction, um, but there's no penalty for being a higher income area because you're building affordable housing for folks there. So that is my main part. Should we do a few questions there? Let's uh, let's wrap. I've got five more slides, and then we'll finish okay. up the Sounds last good. 15 minutes with Q and A. How's that? All right. Thanks, y'all. Been really patient. There's been a lot coming at you. I just want to wrap up here. Some grant writing strategies for success. So as I mentioned before, you know, I've had all the hats. I've, I've written grants before as a nonprofit. I've written grants as a private sector. I've uh, worked on public sector side, reviewing the grants and being the guy with the, the money to hand out. This is kind of what I go through when I think through scoping projects. All right, so a novice grant writer will ask, is my organization eligible for this grant program? If you want to take your level up and become a pro, you ask, who can I partner with? And am I stronger if my project crosses municipal boundaries? It's always harder. Multi-jurisdictional projects are always hard to do. But for a funder who wants to spread money around, remember, you need to think in the mind of that funder, it looks better on their part. A, pro, a novice would say, what projects are eligible? A pro will ask, is my project competitive? Right? It's not just that it's eligible. Lots of things are eligible. But you need to go back and look through that scoring list. Well, who's actually getting the funding? Right? Is it competitive? What projects are most often selected and what do they have in common? What does the scoring criteria say? Again, go back to the scoring criteria. All right, I've, I've read a lot of grants when I was a funder, telling a wonderful story, really compelling, but you didn't follow any of the scoring criteria and you got a two, right? So sorry. What match is required? A more important question is how much can my organization afford to provide? All right, don't meet the minimum. Can you go and exceed that? Again, these funders, I want to spread their money around to as many projects as possible. So if you come in, especially if you're a wealthier community, if you can come in with 30 or 40%, that makes you look like a much better candidate for that funding. What other funding sources can you leverage? What other private sector can you go after? What other tech funding can you get uh, to contribute? When is the grant due? 
Right? That's always a very important question, sure. But more importantly is how much work needs to be completed in advance. There are a lot of long lead items, public outreach. You can't do that overnight and do it meaningfully. Right? If things need council resolutions, you need to get on their agenda well in advance. Right? There's a lot of work. Design, right? if you need concept designs or cost estimates, those can't be done in two weeks. And who will complete it? So again, if your staff don't have the capacity to do that, start to look for help. Look for nonprofits to help out. Look for private sector to help out. Where can I find the grant guidelines? Uh, I think more importantly is who can I speak with from the funding agency? When I was in public sector, it was my job to go out and meet with folks and talk about my grant program. And that's what Carl and Mark are here to do, All right? So go with them and talk about your project. There's a lot that's not stated in the grant guidelines. The grant guidelines have a lot of information. You definitely wanna read those and know those, every single letter of it, but start talking with staff early on and especially in between cycles. Are they able to join a site visit or review a draft? You know, Caltrans Sustainable Transportation Planning Grants, they will actually, Caltrans staff will read your proposal, your draft before you submit it and give you feedback before they go to review it. How great is that? So my last four, start early. If you remember anything, start early. Beware of long lead items. Tell a compelling story. Carl was talking about this before. Mark was mentioning this. Tell a compelling story. Use, it, use data. Cite evidence, you know, use research, use your analysis, use your photos, use your testimonials. What I really wanna see are people taking YouTube videos of folks that are living in these communities and hearing from them directly, and then post that YouTube link in your proposal. Anticipate and mitigate red flags. Funders are looking for reasons not to fund your project because they don't wanna end up with a project that's gonna go belly up. So anticipate and mitigate those red flags. What does that mean? Put yourself in the shoes of the funder. Do you have the right of way under public control? If not, how are you gonna do that? If you've not gone through CEQA or environmental clearance, what are the steps you're gonna do? What are things that the funders are gonna be thinking about that you can already say, I know this might be a concern, here's where we're gonna address it. That puts them into a lot better state of deliverability. And then finally, be persistent, right? You're not gonna win every grant that you go after. So request a debrief, revise and reapply. Right. It's just like suntan lotion. Sometimes you got to put on multiple different coats and sometimes it comes through. So be persistent. And that's it. This is our contact information. We've got another 12 minutes of your time. Thanks a lot. Who's got questions? Briefly before moving to questions, I know a lot of you have a lot of things on your plate. So at a minimum, I just ask you to download this presentation and just mail it and email it to your city staff just so they even have it. Questions? Yeah, thank you all very much for your presentation. Uh, I had one question, I think it was uh, for Mark. Um, at some point you mentioned you're giving more points uh, for a, uh, a bus uh, versus, you know, pedestrian, cyclists, et cetera. And that argument was based on greenhouse gas emissions. And I was wondering, uh, you know, given uh, the difference between greenhouse gas emissions being a global issue and, and local pollution being a separate issue, what was the motivation behind that uh, argument, you know, the, or the system of giving an electrified bus, you know, more points than walking and biking? Uh, you know, we should somewhere taking the, the consideration also that the electric bus had some impact on greenhouse emissions as well, maybe not local pollution. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, the short of that is that the greenhouse gas quantification method um, is, is created by the California Air Resources Board. Um, and there's a bunch of them. I think ATP has one, even though I don't think there's points directly tied to it. Um, but ultimately they have, it's based on census data, VMT reduction, um, and type of trip that's taken. And you know this, the national census data says, well, the average bike trip is 1.2 miles and 0.2% you know, of the population takes a bike. So when you add that in, it's like, oh, well, there's a minimal amount. And that number uh, is different in Oakland. It's different in Los Angeles. It's different in different, you know, different places, but there's kind of a, a data there and um, they have to come up with some data and that's the data that was chosen. Um, but one of the good parts is that we value our partners there um, and we work with them closely to make sure that we're complementing. Um, and it's kind of counterbalancing, but it's kind of complementing where we're giving the points for the bike lanes 
and giving points for sidewalks because they are not quantified in the greenhouse gas reduction fund. The same applies to the internet, uh, same applies to anti-displacement. And so we're having this balance where, you know, we only have hundred points and you cut that pie into bits and some of it is greenhouse gas. And then some of it is other things that we want that don't get you points in the GHG quantification. And so it's kind of um, a way that we're intentionally trying to do a one or the other. I have a five-year-old, you know, it's like eat your broccoli and you get a chocolate, you know, and kind of like figuring out ways to, to do both um, in there. So. Hi, uh, I'm representing a nonprofit. Uh, we uh, sued uh, Caltrans when they were building the Caldecott Tunnel and we got awarded $8 million. And we got a whole list of projects from one to 50. And our project was two to build some sidewalks the community that has nothing. And Oakland built, designed it, but then they ran out of money because they spent on lower priorities. How do you think we can, we, everything is designed, it's, it's shovel ready. How can we get this built? I might ask you that. I, I'm thinking HSIP, but. Yeah, it's a good question. Not knowing this this project area well enough, I think you just got to find either folks, you know, the local city council person. I think is where I'd start with that. Okay, then I think you're going to have to go through staff uh, and get them involved, or find a coalition, a larger coalition, to make this a uh, more priority. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't have the, the silver bullet. Some things that just don't have the political support are really hard to kind of overcome overcome that. Yeah. More questions, all right. Hi, uh, my question is about projects that are shovel ready versus projects that are not shovel ready and the ATP application. So it's my understanding that both shovel ready and not shovel ready projects can apply. They're both eligible. However, eligibility, as you said, is not the same as competitiveness. And the ones that are already shovel ready are probably more competitive than the ones that are not. So my question is for those projects that are not yet shovel ready, it's ATP is maybe not the best place for them to look for funding. What are some other funding programs, sources of grant money for projects that need to get shovel ready to get them shovel ready? All right, so I'll take this one. Um, so in MTC's regional competitive program, we do prioritize projects that have already com have completed their environmental process. The state, however, does not um, require that, nor is it a, a scoring criteria. So overall, it may, it may, it may look more attractive, but that um, they, the state has funded plenty of projects as well as MTC that are beginning their environmental process or still need to go through engineering. Um, I, yeah, so that, that isn't necessarily entirely true for the active transportation program. Most of them come in for environmental too. So most of them are for the full project all the way starting in environmental. Um, Any more questions? One, one thing on that, Matthew, I'm not sure where you're, where you're based or not, but I know um, in my previous role, the Riverside County and their, uh, the local funds, you know, they kind of have extra points that they can give to whatever category they want. And Riverside County wanted to see results. And so they just said, if you're shovel ready, you get an extra 10 points at the local level. And they just said, we want to see it built. We don't want to do the plans. And so the Riverside projects, um, you know, we're literally, if it was shovel ready, you might not win at the state level, but then at the local level, you jumped up by 10 points, which would be enough to usually push you forward. So sometimes the, the whether it's MTC or the other MPOs will sometimes make shovel ready an additional category. So worth noting, depending on where you live. Just a question on TCC grants, maybe for Mark. Um, I just, I, I was Googling, like, is that something that agencies and nonprofits should look at for planning for active transportation infrastructure? Is that something that, you know, is more something else? Yeah, I'm, I'm six months on the job and I work closely with the, the TCC team, but I, I wish I could speak more to it. Um, but TCC is a really awesome program. It's deep engagement. Um, they don't get as much continuous funding as we get, so it's been on and off. But it is something that for especially advocacy organizations, um, local community-based advocacy organizations can really work together and they partner with usually the city um, and then is really about visioning your community and identifying what's missing, what you need, what else or what needs to be added or removed and is really um, a deep vision. I like to think of like AHSC is like build the thing here and TCC is on the other end of the 
how do we make sure that the community's voices are empowered and heard? Um, and they're a great team and that will be launching, the NOFA for that comes out in about two or three months, I think. The NOFA's out, okay, yeah, so yeah. I think it was like the last couple of weeks, so yeah, but um, yeah. But yeah, and I can happily connect, you know, reach out to me or come talk to me afterward and I can give you the contact information. And similar to what Carl said, there's actually technical assistance for people to apply. Um, AHSC has that as well, but usually for cities. But yeah, TCC is a really great program if you have a community-based led organization ready to see change. All right, we got time for more. It's 3.25, otherwise we can let you get on and, and go have a snack or get ready for the next session. Anybody guys have a last question? Yeah. Oh, hold on, hold on for the people online. Okay. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. We're going to talk with the Cal Bike folks, and we're going to try and get this presentation on the website. And uh, otherwise, if you signed up, we'll we'll make sure we we'll find it. We'll get it distributed out that way. Or email uh, any of us directly. Yeah, or, or give us an email. Thank you all. all right. Thank you.